Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. I'm here today with my assistant to help to show you a way to dissect a chicken wing. Though you may have dissected chicken wings before, the purpose of this dissection is to look at how the different muscles and bones work together to make a functioning elbow joint. You'll see some similarities and some differences. I'll explain those throughout the process. And I'm going to show you what I want you to see when you dissect your own. So let's cut right to it. Now, these are going to be the tools you'll use. You won't use all of them necessarily, but they will be available to you. You'll have your dissection specimen. There will be some sharps disposals around. You'll have forceps, both normal and tissue forceps. You'll have ratcheting forceps to help you put on your blade to your scalpel. Because these are small and delicate specimens, we are going to be using a number 10 blade on a number three scalpel. You'll have a dull probe and you'll have some dissecting scissors. You'll also have a dissection pan and you'll want to put some paper towel in to aid in cleanup. The first step is to remove your specimen and put it into the pan to determine whether it is a right or left wing. Please save your bags for disposal of the specimen at the end. Now, it's important to know whether you are looking at a right or left wing because the reference materials typically are going to be on a left wing, and so you don't want to mix up medial and lateral if you are looking at the wrong side of the wing. Most references that look at human arms, however, look at right arms, and so you'll really want to be paying attention to what is medial and what is lateral, knowing if you have a right or left wing. This is a left wing. It would attach to the body of the chicken here. This is the lateral or outer side. It's got thicker skin. And this is the medial side. The skin is much thinner. This is the side where we will focus because it has more of the muscles we'll be looking at. Next, I'm going to be putting on the scalpel blade and we're going to remove the skin from the medial side of the wing, taking care not to uh, cut through this section of skin. This is a double layered section of skin with some tissue in it as well. It's called the propotagium. And we want to investigate what is in there because it's going to be a major difference between human arms and chicken wings. So you're going to try to find a loose part of skin and start separating it from the muscle, trying to keep the muscles intact as you do so, using more of a scraping motion than a cutting motion away from the muscles. Now, once you get the wing to this point, there are some interesting things to note. This is a muscle and a tendon that support the propotagium, and this muscle and tendon, this structure is called the pars propotagialis. It's got parts of the bicep and parts of the deltoid, and it connects here to the structure that is analogous to the wrist in the chicken and it helps to bring the wing in and have better control over the wing. As you can see, I'm able to separate the tendon away from the skin if I'm careful. The muscle tears more easily than the tendon, but you can see as you pull it what this tendon and muscle, what action they cause. And it is to bring the wing in. A Little bit of internal rotation, but also flexion of the elbow joint.
Once you've realized that, you're welcome to separate the tendon and to remove the skin as best as you can from the lateral side. Really, we don't need to focus on this part, this distal part of the wing, um, because we're focusing on the elbow joint. So now here, I've got the skin removed, and I'm going to start using my doll probe and my fingers to separate individual muscles so they can better be observed and identified. So here we can see some interesting muscles now. We can see, again, this is medial, and so this is the inside, this would be facing the torso. We can see the biceps brachii, in addition to the part of the bicep that was supporting the propatagium. We can see two parts of the triceps. On a chicken, they're referred to as the medial and lateral head of the triceps. In humans, they're referred to as the humerotriceps on the inside because it connects to the humerus, and the scapulotriceps because it connects to the scapula. Medial humero, lateral scapulotriceps. They're also sometimes referred to as the long head and the lateral head. When you pull them, you can note that they are antagonistic muscles because you pull them just as though they would contract when the animal was alive. When you pull the bicep, it draws in the wing, it flexes the elbow joint. Now notice that even when I let it go, the joint kind of stays there. And so to extend the joint, not just does the biceps have to relax, but the triceps have to contract as well. And so when you pull the triceps, notice that it extends. And so you have two antagonistic muscles that cause opposite motions, flexion and extension of the same joint. In the lower section of the wing, you have an extensor here that extends the wrist joint and you have flexors on the bottom that flex the wrist joint when you pull them. This is referred to as the extensor carpi radialis. It's near the radius bone. This would be the thumb. This is analogous to a thumb in humans, though it's called an alula in chickens and this extends that joint and these flex that joint. This is called the pronator superficialis a profundus. It works a little bit to pull the wing in to pronate and angle it this way, though they don't get quite the range of motion that we do in our elbows. At this point, it's going to be time to remove the muscles around this joint so that we can view it from the back and cut into it to really look at these shapes of the bones. Now through this process of removing things, you can start to see what really held this joint together, what holds these bones together. There are some small ligaments here and here. 
the tendons that were connected to the muscle, and some more ligaments here, all comprising the joint capsule, which was protecting this joint and keeping in the lubricating synovial fluid. Now keeping the joint together, but removing the structures holding it together at the back half, at the posterior half, you can see where everything fit together. To reorient ourselves, we have on the thumb side the radius and the ulna. And so here the radius and the ulna. The ulna also has this projection, the olecranon, which is the main part that connects and keeps it in line with the humerus. On the humerus, remember to reorient ourselves that this is a left humerus. We have the medial epicondyle and the lateral epicondyle, these edges where muscles attach. The part where the radius fits in, the capitulum, and the part that connects to the ulna, the trochlea. The small groove here where the olecranon fits is the olecranon fossa. On the inside of the ulna, this small part, so we have the olecranon and opposite it is the coronoid process. And it fits in a gap on the humerus here called the coronoid fossa. At this point, I'm going to cut more of the ligaments that are holding the joints together so we can view further in. From this view, you can very well see the head of the radius where it would fit in to the humerus here. And you can see an anterior view, finally, of the humerus and an anterior view of the radius and ulna where they would all fit together. And the last thing to appreciate is how the ligaments here really do still hold these two together if you were careful in your dissection. And you can see where these two connect this part of the ulna where the radius fits in, the radial notch. Once you're done for disposal, please put all of your pieces of your specimen back into the bag, remove your scalpel blade and put it into the sharps container, and wash everything with soap and water because this is raw chicken. Now here on our skeleton, you can see all of those same structures that we saw on the chicken bones. You can see the humerus, the radius, and the ulna, the medial epicondyle, and the lateral epicondyle. You can see the capitulum that fits into the radius, and the trochlea, which joins to the olecranon of the ulna. You can see the coronoid process here on the ulna, you can see the radial notch where the radius fits in. This divot here where the coronoid process fits in is the coronoid fossa. And the notch here behind the coronoid process would be the trochlear notch where the trochlea fits in. On the back, again, you can see the medial and lateral epicondyles, the radius and the ulna, the olecranon, and the olecranon fossa where the olecranon fits in when the joint extends. Well, thanks for watching. I hope you were able to follow along. I hope it was good enough for you to see what to do. And I hope that you are as successful and had as much fun in your dissection as I did with mine.